Friends, the Lord be with you. Thank you so very much for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, we think there's another Abbey group uh, that will be coming, but uh, time is of the essence. Uh, this morning after the chapel service, uh, President McCurry said, I wanted to go a little longer, uh, but I was told I had to stop. And I said, next time just go. So we are going to make sure that we are uh, good uh, hosts and that we give President McCurry as much time as he needs or as the spirit moves this afternoon. Uh, this is the annual uh, Leonard F. Stoudemire Lecture in Multicultural Ministry. Uh, it is named in honor of the late Reverend Leonard Foster Stoudemire, a pioneer African-American clergyman and church planter here in Holland, Michigan. Uh, we have a special treat today because in a few moments we will hear from Reverend Denise Kingdom, who was actually a student here at Western uh, and was instrumental in establishing this lecture series. So, Reverend Kingdom, thank you for being here and, and for um, sharing with us a bit of the significance and the history of this lecture. Uh, before I turn it over to you, I do want to say two words of uh, gratitude. First, uh, the Justice and Reconciliation Cohort have really uh, taken ownership of this uh, lecture series. They have uh, read uh, President McCurry's book, spent time ahead of the event in, 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 in Zoom conversation, preparing and really curating and thinking about the kind of interactions and questions that will be most beneficial for our community. So I, I know that not all of them are here quite yet, but I do see Ruth and Shamari step out right there. Shamari right there. Uh, just can we just express our appreciation to the Justice and Reconciliation Cohort members? Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, and then, um, President McCreary, uh, before I take my seat, uh, I just want you to know how deeply grateful I am uh, for your friendship, for your brotherhood, for your colleagueship and for taking the time uh, from your busy schedule and institutional demands. Uh, President McCurry actually had to kind of squeeze us in uh, because he had commitments before uh, this week and then immediately on, on Tuesday evening, Wednesday morning. Uh, but uh, he said, you know what, uh, for Western to be here, to be with all of us, he said, I, I'm gonna try to make it work. So uh, President McCurry, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Th thank you for being here, and I praise God for uh, the work that you've already done through your presence here, and I look forward to see how the Spirit will continue to use your words and presence to impact our community uh, in the days to come. So, on that note, Reverend Kingdom, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, first of all, Dr. Felix, thank you, my president, for welcoming me to this to this fine occasion and for this opportunity to share a little bit of history. Thank you to my other president as I sit on the Board of Trustees at New Brunswick Theological Seminary, right, um, uh, Dr. Micah. <laughs> and uh, to you all here at Western Theological Seminary. Um, I'm gonna may repeat one or two things that you already said about um, Reverend Stoutmeyer. Um, however, here we go. The Leonard F. Stoutmeyer Lectures in Multicultural Ministries are named in honor of late Reverend Leonard Foster Stoutmeyer, pioneer African-American clergyman, church planter to Holland, Michigan. Reverend Stoutmeyer was born in 1892 and lived in Morgan Ark, Illinois. With his wife and his four children, Ruth, Leonard Dean, yes indeed, Earl and Francis, when he received God's call to become a church planter. This call ultimately led him to Holland, Michigan here in 1944, where his assignment was to plant a church for all nations. Having been met with resistance in the new community, still crippled by racial apartheid, he was relegated to the far north of the city, where he established the city's first intentionally multiracial church, all nations, full gospel church on Berry Street, where it continues to worship on Sundays. Reverend Stoutmeyer left his legacy and met with his Lord in October 1987. The purpose of this lecture series that holds his name 
was born with a series of events I had the privilege to participate in here at Western Theological Seminary. In 2008, Western Seminary contracted with theologian, consultant, and author, Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil, to assess the history and culture of diversity efforts at Western. After conducting interviews, facilitating focus groups, and exploring the history of our seminary, she provided a report that would lead us into second order change in the areas of diversity and belonging. Her report led to the establishment of the seminary's diversity team, consisting of faculty, staff, and students. This report also led us to launch Western's faculty fellow program, which invited ABD scholars of color to our community to diversify the face, the voice, and the work of our faculty and institution. Of the many faculty fellows were Eric Williams, Chris Dorsey, and of course our own Reverend Dr. Han Lewin, Council Kalmai. Hello, my dear. Salter McNeil's report also gave birth to this lecture series, the Leonard F. Stoutmeyer Lecture Series, which since its origin in 2010, intends to equip seminarians, faculty, staff, alumni, and local congregations with resources for increased intercultural competence and cultural understanding for greater effectiveness in Christian ministry. This lecture series has welcomed scholars such as, but not limited to, the Christian imaginations, Dr. Willie Jennings, pastor and author of The Next Evangelical, Dr. Sun Chan Ra, womanist ethnodoxologist, Dr. Cheryl Kirk Dugan, and Native American scholar, Reverend Randy Woodley. As an alum of this fine institution twice, that's me, and one of the curators <laughs> of this lecture series, I'm so pleased to see 15 years later, Reverend Stoutmeyer's vision and the groundbreaking work of many like Reverend Dr. Cynthia Holder Rich, Reverend Dr. Leanne Van Dyke, and her former president, Reverend Dr. Tim Brown's commitment to diversity in theological education at Western Theological Seminary still lives on through this lecture series. Thank you. Oh, I'm supposed to introduce you. And so I introduce to you second year student, Ruth Langkamp. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Reverend Denise. Friends, before I introduce us to the esteemed Dr. Reverend Micah McCrary, um, some business hospitality things for you. Uh, you have no paper and pen, either you're sitting on it or it's next to you. If you are somebody who likes to pay attention by taking notes, we encourage you to take that, take some notes. At the end of this lecture, we will invite you to ask questions of um, the conversation you've heard. So we really encourage you, take some notes. If you brought your own notebook, because you are like me, you take furious notes, don't take the paper, give it to somebody who didn't bring a notebook, <laughs> all right? Um, second thing is that we're grateful you're here. We, as is quite often the tradition of blackness and people of color, time is not a thing. So you may be here longer than 4.15. So take a deep breath. We promise to try to get you out of here by 4.15, okay? But if we don't, it's fine, and you will enjoy it. So with that said, um, I would like to introduce Reverend Dr. Michael McCrary. He is a native of Detroit, Michigan, so he'll probably tell you some stories from his time in Michigan. Uh, but he has been in the president of Western, uh, he has been, <laughs> we wish, no we don't. He has been the, we're grateful for where you are and we're grateful you're here. Um, <laughs> Dr. McGreary began his term as the 12th president of New Brunswick Theological Seminary in 2017. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from the University of Michigan a Master of Divinity from Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology, a Master of Science and PhD in Counseling and Psychology from Virginia Commonwealth University. Wow. Dr. McCreary's new book, Trauma and Race, A Pathway of Wellbeing, was published 
from Portress Press in September 2013. And this is from the space in which we will get to dialogue together today. What this wonderful, wonderful bio does not tell you about Dr. McCreary is that he is a troublemaker, he is a question asker, he is a friend, he is a storyteller, and more than anything, he is a follower and lover of our dear God. So please give a hand for Dr. McCreary. I give honor to God, our creator, God our redeemer, and God our empowerer. I give honor to the ancestors, particularly Dr. Stratemeyer. I'm gonna make him a doctor today. To, and it's just on my spirit, Ida B. Wells, Abraham Lincoln, Malcolm X, Martin King, and Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy, and many others who in this battle for human oneness have been cast aside by death, by society, by need. I give honor to my family, my spouse of 41 years, my dynamic daughter, my adopted and fostered children. I give honor to every student who, because they ask questions and they pushed boundaries, have made me who I am. I give honor to every mentor, every teacher, those who did it with love, those who did it with hatred, those who did it out of ignorance, those who did it out of wisdom. I give honor to the elder of this house, the Reverend Felix de Negraja. I give honor to the General Secretary of the Reformed Church in America. I give honor to my boss, the Reverend Kingdom. I give honor to Dr. Kate, Director Kate, who will be Dr. Kate one day, proper son. <laughs> And I give honor to all of you all who have come. I don't have a lot of patience. I don't have good sense. I am very active and crazy. And so if I leave this vessel um, that is trying to act intelligent, please understand that that's a part of me too. I just left it. <laughs> Benjamin Elijah Mays, God rest his spirit as well, said, it isn't calamity to die with dreams unfulfilled, but it is a calamity not to dream. It is not a disaster to be unable to capture your ideals, but it is a, dis a disaster to have no ideals to capture. It is not a disgrace not to reach the stars, but it is a disgrace to have no stars to reach for. My life has been as a person behind the scenes helping folk to reach dreams, to capture ideas, and to reach stars. And I hope that something that I say in this short period of time in a three hour lecture that I'll do in an hour, um, we'll do that for you. Objectives, if, if I could. I would love to talk about the intersection of race and trauma with Alanos. And Alanos are African, comma, parenthesis, black, Latino, Latinx, Latin, no, Latin, Hispanic, Asian, which is Chinese, Pacific Islanders, Korean, Japanese, native, which is First Nation, indigenous Americans. And I recognize that I contextualize my conversation with just America. There are so many other issues that would influence and form and broaden our thinking if we went outside of this domain, this domicile that we live on, of this continent. 
I, I hate that we're just talking about America. We haven't recognized there's a North America and there's a South America. We're just the middle America. So I recognize all of that. To discuss burnout in marginalized communities and that really would help us with health, um, to outline signs and symptoms of trauma and what that is, how we can address those issues. And then to look at, and, and I'll probably skip here if I don't get here soon, um, to best practices, to promising practices. And I use those two terms. If you read the book, you, you know I use those two terms because there's things that are empirically validated. Um, but there are also things that those of us who have done this work for, for me, clinical work for 30 years, we know works even if it hasn't been validated. And so how do you look at and engage the things which are empirically validated and the things which are experientially validated, okay? And then of course, the spiritual component, the pastoral care and counseling component, which for me as a clinician beginning out, I, I went to seminary before I did my doctor work. I worked as a youth pastor and, and working with families before I did my divinity work completed and of course before I did my doctorate. And so my practice has always been based upon what someone said to me, which I could not stand early on, is that you use your prayer too much. And I'm like, go somewhere. Find yourself. Prayer has brought me thus far along the way. You know, through dangers, through many valleys, through dangers, toils and snares I've come. And it was prayer that kept me. Shut up, Mr. Supervisor. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so pastoral care is a part of the clinical piece. And that's not looked well upon when you deal with what does it mean to be a counselor? What does it mean to be a psychologist, to be licensed to work for a state agency that does not recognize that you are also a pastor on the side? No, dude, I was a pastor before I got here. Where you at? Okay. I'm, I'm gonna behave someday. Uh, not today. Not today. So I have this in three parts. Um, the first part is just kind of the trauma and race introduction pieces. The second part, if we get to it, is really looking at some underlying theories that have really moved me to where I am, many that I've forgotten to put into the book, but they, because they're just normal and natural and, and a part of me. And then the last is really looking at the pathway model I talk about here. So let's start with a page 42 at the bottom um, for those who want to, this is one of the readings there. Intersectionality is experienced by people of color throughout the world. I went to Haiti as a pastoral psychologist to work with pastors and their families a week after the Haitians experienced a 7.0 magnitude earthquake in January of 2010. I will never forget arriving on the runway of the Toussaint de Overture International Airport in Port-au-Prince. The damage to the airport was so extensive that we had to exit the plane on the runway and walk from the plane to the terminal. Upon leaving the airport and arriving in the city, seeing the damage to buildings, the loss of lives and the homelessness, it was harrowing. Literally, you all, there were people's bodies without their spirits any longer in them on the side being burned. Um, we ran out of gas because they, there were no open gas stations and we bought gas from this kid on a motorcycle. I'm like, dude, that bottle does not look like something you wanna buy. He loaded it into the car and Two seconds later, the car stopped completely. You know, I had to push the car. Now here I am, invited scholar, pushing the car. <laughs> the Haitian people who had lost everything but their lives created homes and shelters from scraps of tin, discarded construction materials, tarps and blankets. And these areas became known as the tent cities. Haitian women and children in particular reported suffering abuse and hardships in those communities. The mission organization that sent me to Haiti took, took me and 300 other Haitians to the mountain retreat facility for two weeks of worship, Bible study, and workshops to facilitate emotional and spiritual healing. I, was trans I had transported, this is how dumb I was, y'all. I had transported my computer, my LCD projector, and my speakers with me anticipating using my technology to engage and entertain the participants. It turned out there was no electricity. 
So what I had to do, I combined Bible study with role plays and group activities. I was excited about the work. I did a Bible study on Daniel and the lion's den in which the pastor played Daniel and laid in the middle of the angry, hungry lions. The lions were played by the children who circled him, growling and snapping their teeth at him. I then directed the mothers to surround the lions in prayer and the fathers to surround the mothers praying and watching. I thought the Bible study was insightful and informative. We discussed the dangers of individualism and the power of community. What I mean, the activity demonstrated to them how one strong man could not be picked up. So I had one pastor to go and to try to pick up Daniel from the lion's den. He couldn't do it. Then I had seven women, children, and pastors to take, two took the feet, two took the hips, two took the shoulders, one took the head. And of course, they were able to lift him and carry him out. And, and, and the thing was, it was so much the Lord was there in that the pastor I'd asked to play Daniel, unbeknownst to me, his name was, yeah, yeah. I'm like, come on, Holy Ghost. <laughs> in the group activities and the role plays, we focused on the trauma that had arisen in the community because of the earthquake. I was targeting the trauma results from serious injuries, loss of property, and loss of lives. The people, people performed the role plays dramatically well. Women dressed in costume, characterizing their unspeakable distress as they acted out and searched for their lost children among the rubble. The young people acted out the drugs and the gang problems in Haiti, and all went well with that. You, I'll let you keep reading it if you want to. If you don't, that's cool too. Um, the interesting piece was is that before I knew it, the, the men in the office, in the, in the room there, had already left the room, the pastor. They had left. And then all of a sudden, they came walking, marching back in, like the Fruit of Islam in, in Detroit. They all marched in, lined up, and then looked at me, and then just turned. And I said, what's going on? He said, they're shunning you. They were shunning me because they did not want the pain and the agony, the despair that was coming out to be made public. They said they only wanted me to come there and preach and teach and do that work. They did not want the psychological work. Fast forward, um, I was on a call maybe a year ago and this one educator from Haiti was on the call and someone asked the question, what do you all need? He said, back in 2010, you all sent over a psychologist. And the work that that person did is the kind of help we need now. And I just laughed because he was my translator. I guess he forgot what I look like. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I had hair back then or something. So in, 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 in looking at this, this, I did this study back in um, the early 1900s, no, 19, <laughs> 1990s. And, and what, I, what I try to show there is that, does this have a pointer? It does, all right. You get um, the first part of stress is that an occurrence happens, a stressful event happens. It can be major, it can be minor, okay? So for example, I, for a major event, I, I used the accident I had again in August the 10th of 2016 and that I'm, I'm driving my car after university work, after church work, after clinical work, and this gentleman next to me falls asleep. When he falls asleep, he, is, he, he crashes into a car. He is somehow thrown from his car right in front of me, and I have no other, I either run him over or hit the accident, okay? I hit the accident, I broke a rib, I messed up my shoulder. A minor event would be I'm jogging after graduating, I've turned back home to Detroit to help out my mom, and I'm jogging down Detroit, Jefferson Avenue in Detroit, the south side of Detroit, and this wonderful blue truck with these gentlemen in it rode by and they yelled out, N-word. Okay, that's a minor hassle. So those are minor hassles. What I argue is that after you look at the occurrence of it, you can also look at some additional cultural things that happen you know, minority status. So the N-word probably, you know, because I was a person of color, um, that had meaning, okay? 
Um, you know, yeah, that has, that has some serious meaning. Uh, you know, um, there, th this discrimination issues that, that happened on my life, the fact that Jefferson Avenue was where the tanks rolled down in 68, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, wow, this is deep. You know, um, social economic status, if you look at the accident that I had, there's some socioeconomic status questions there, you know, when it comes to having a car, having a car total, et cetera. So all those kind of things are important to look at. Then after you have the event, you then have primary appraisal, okay? Primary appraisal is, am I in trouble, all right? We'll take the minor hassle, for example. I, you know, when, when I, I, I turned, and, and forgive me for, for what I'm about to say, but I, I, I turned and he, immediately the warrior came up when they called me the N-word when that truck went by and I said some words which I won't, don't say too often anymore. Um, I expressed them with much, much fever and, and energy. They understood that if you get off that truck, you know, it's gonna be on. But more importantly, was I in trouble? No, because I was in my neighborhood. So if they got off the truck, I knew the park right behind me. I could cut through the park. I had played baseball in that park my whole life and football. I knew where the courts were. I knew where my boys were. I knew where houses were. I knew where the pottery was. I knew all, hey, come on, get off the truck. Try to catch me if you want to. So I was not in trouble. Plus they kept going. <laughs> now, major hassle, was I in trouble? One, I've just totaled my car. Two, I don't know if the guy is dead or did I hit him because I went unconscious when I first hit, you know? And, and so I realized, yes, I'm in trouble, okay? So with the major, it didn't move me from primary appraisal. If, it, if it's not in trouble, you go out, you go out of the stress. But because second, and what can be done? I moved to secondary now, what could be done? And in the mid, before I say that too, of course, there's some cultural pieces, like I just talked about, the family um, is there, the community I was in, the class issues would be a major culture with the car. If I didn't have money, like the woman that was hit first, she didn't have resources, okay? She was a female in the midst of, she got a gender issue going on. She didn't have her car, you know, was already paid for. Now that it was damaged, what was she gonna do with her life? She wound up doing some suing. Okay, um, because of that. And um, fortunately, I didn't get sued. Hallelujah. Secondary, what can be done? And that's kind of it. For me, you know, there, I'm like, call my wife, babe, I'm, I'm all right, but um, I've just had a major accident. I need to get to the doctors. Can you come get me? You know, that, that's kind of there. You do something with it as well. And then, you know, there's some culture pieces around that. We just talked about a little class issues. And then coping, you know, it's, for, it's either problem focused or emotional focus. And to be able to differentiate that is very, very important when it comes to stress and coping. Some people, like myself, you know, emotional coping is, is okay, but I, I like to, I actually start doing my Tai Chi or something because I'm a behavioral, you know, so you do behavioral focusing. That copes better for me. Um, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't get caught up in my emotions. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to, you know, but, but give me a gym, give me a boxing bag, give me something to do, you know, let me go play some hoop, you know. So there are a number of ways of, of dealing with the stress that way. And then you have to adopt, um, which is there as well. Now, staying with that, one of my um, former students and colleagues, Steve Sandage, in 23, did a study with, I think he did it with Wang from Olive Fuller, and they called it the National Study of Clergy, Chaplains, and Therapists. It's, it's important, if you would, to focus not on the risk, because I, I could really go into, the, it, it's sad, this is sad, 75% reported symptoms in the post-traumatic stress range. I could go, with well, what does that mean? 82% reported symptoms of moderate to severe depression. Those are the risks, that's, that's pretty bad. But for me, what's important about the study is the protective factors, okay? We forget, we, we minimize the power of church, the power of what we do. But if you notice all of those protective factors, they're all things that really happen in community, that happen in church, that happen, you know, in what we do. Supportive self-management. I mean, that, that's learning to be humble. In a sense, and it talks about cultural humility and, 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 and just humility itself, but learning to manage the self, you know, the way we regulate and we talk and we pray, we set our lives together, we set a schedule for what we do. All those kind of things are protective factors. So what we teach folk to do is a protective factor. Work and family boundaries is a protective factor. And then I, I, I don't want to go into differentiation of self, but that to me is a protective factor that is the most hindered by trauma. 
okay? And I'll say more about that in a few seconds. That's, that's the one, it's a protective factor, but it's actually one of the ones that I think stress and trauma really affects more than anything else. So what, I, what I'm pushing towards here is that stress is there. We all have stress. Um, there's socio-racial stress, and I, I, I want to just say, as I said this morning in the chapel, I like socio-race. I don't like the term race because race is not a biological construct. Folks still want to make it one and all that, and that's their business. They're grown. They can do whatever they want. I'm grown. My way is that it is not biological. There's no human. Just God made one of us. God did not make about six of us. So, you know, and so the homo sapiens that we are, we are the same. And, and all the data can be there. There's too much data that says we're, we're one race and all these cultural differences, all these things that happen to us are different. And I use the case all the time of sickle cell because it's the easiest for us. Sickle cell is not an African American sickness. You know, everyone thinks that, but it's a Mediterranean illness. It's because of the climate there and the need to survive there. So those who folk who came from there may carry this sickle cell trait. You know, it's not because black folk get this and no white folk do. No, there are a lot of white folk who have it. Okay, they just don't talk about that. Uh, you know, and, and, and you know, okay. Uh, I'll stay there. Uh, trauma is a product of actual or threatened to danger. It's a result of serious injury. It's a result of serious sexual violence. And, 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 and we just, I think we minimize what trauma is and how it can be triggered. Trauma is not necessarily a disorder, though. I want to put it there. I tell people all the time, I'm, I, I've, I've suffered trauma in my life, no question. I can tell you some stories that you say, OK, yeah, that traumatized them. Um, you know, that's just there. But even after my car, which was a trauma, Okay, with a rib injury, I couldn't sleep for a couple of months, an injury. I never was so much so that I couldn't get back into a car. I couldn't get behind the wheel, okay? A disorder is when it's happened so much so now I can't do that anymore, all right? And that's, that's one of the major things you wanna look at. Together with stress, you know, and the stress of race and the stress of trauma, it really results in what I call complex trauma. And, and one of the things I argue in the book is that you can actually differentiate it that way as well, okay? Um, if anybody gets sleepy, to do like I do, just stand up. It's okay with me, all right? Trauma, uh, wow, some of the symptoms. And I, I, I want to make this, this, yeah, let me make this clear. Um, it's an inability to experience pleasure. Everybody knows what that means. One of the things, that is, it's a distressing feeling of unhappiness. And, and a lot of times we think a person is just distressed, but it's really connected to trauma. External anger, it's important, I think, to differentiate external anger from aggression. All right, aggression is internal. External anger is anger that's external. The other piece is fragmentation, where our left brain, you know, um, just disconnects. You just can't remember. You, you can see it all the time with someone when they, when they get triggered, they just can't remember what they were going to say. It's just it's just not there. They don't have the language. It's just not there. And then of course there's the numbing. Folk who just you know really really need the the, the, the medicines to take care of it right now. Okay, I gotta, I gotta find some way to take this pain away, you know, so, you know, I'm gonna drink a little bit, I'm gonna, you know, do, do whatever it is it is, takes to take care of the pain, is there as well. Now, like I said earlier, for me, trauma beats up on self-organization. And, and, and that's one of the pieces that, that's really there, is that this is such an important part of us for our ability to be protected, to, to self-protect, to family protect, but we're so, when you get that trauma, it really does is where emotional regulation becomes almost impossible, okay? So many young people I worked with as a therapist, they weren't ADHD, they weren't, you know, hyperactive. They were unable to regulate their emotions because of the pain that they're going through. Not making any excuses, okay? I don't make excuses at all, um, but that's just real. You know, I'm, I'm all over the place because I'm trying to, to control this stuff, and then they're unable to do that as well. And one of the things that really works well, I had, I had martial arts in my interventions all through uh, my grant work um, for about 20 years because it really helped to have those young men who are going through that kind of stuff to just learn, you know, to just, just control the emotions, you know, just learn what it means to just. Oh, it feels good even now. Um, and then there's the negative self-concept. 
and, and, and belief in the self as worthy, you know, to believe that you're worthy. But when we get in environments where we trigger folks' racial stress in particular, you can see, or gender stress, or class stress, or cultural stress, or theological stress, all those things, if you ever notice, and you're giving the exam and you just can't find the words, it's there. Okay, not trying to give excuses, but just dealing with the realities. And when that happens, you feel like I'm worthless. You feel like I'm nothing, you know, and you just want to run. And I'll, I'll give some examples of how to come against this in, in a short piece. And then there's the relational difficulties. You know, I, I'm not shocked that many of the folks that I've worked with in counseling who've gone through trauma are on their second, third, fourth marriage, okay? Um, and even if they never got married to the person, it's still their second, third, or fourth marriage. Okay, we can legalize it or we can just do it. You know, there's some, there's some ways of having fun without getting caught. Anyway, um, okay, y'all are so nice. <laughs> and, and what I'm talking about here is the social determinant. I mean, we know, you know, the Health and Human Services, the, everybody, that's, that's probably 2021. 20, I don't know why there's extra zero there. Uh, extra two there, who knows what it is. Um, so in terms of health, our conditions such as birth, life, work, play, worship, uh, age that affect health. And, you know, and, and worship can affect it in a positive or a negative way, um, only because of the trauma. If, if, if your church is a place that traumatizes you, let me tell you, I don't care whether you're the minister of music, you can still, that worship can become painful for you. It's kind of there as well. Um, things like mindfulness, meditation, um, communal. You know, don't these sound like church? Okay, mindfulness, you know. Can everybody go, just go, hallelujah. Come on, everybody. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come on, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. See how it just switched you from being tired and bored and got you back and woke some of y'all up right quick? Uh, it, it's really, I mean, these are the things that protect us and move us. And we take for advantage, we do them all the time, and we don't realize that these are the things that our communities need, okay? These are the things that, that the millennial, the Gen Xs, they, they need. In addition to, we, we're always focusing on what, why they don't come, and we don't recognize that a lot of what we do, if we frame it in this way, they recognize this is good stuff because they're just doing it out there calling it spirituality. You know, um, same thing, hallelujah. <laughs> okay, yeah, man, gosh. All right. I'm not going to read because y'all look too bored already. Okay, um, so I, I want to do this. And th I'm, I'm doing this because this was something that was introduced to me back in the 60s. And it's still so relevant today. Okay, like many of the theories I'm going to talk about in a second, they were introduced to me in the 80s and they're still relevant today. In, in, in mental side, it's mental suicide. And it's really what my guy um, talked about, is Marcus Garvey, you know, mental slavery. Anybody ever heard the song by um, some, some rapper with long hair, or is he a raggae with long hair? Sing the song. Protect yourself against mental slavery. None can. Okay, y'all don't get it. Wrong crowd, wrong crowd. Uh, <laughs> Woo, y'all heard of Bob Marley, come on now. All right, Bob Marley, that was Bob Marley, you've heard of him. So what Bobby Wright said, a psychologist in, in Chicago, for you Chicagoans in the house, is he talked about mental suicide, mental suicide. He said it's the deliberate and systematic destruction of an individual's or a group's ideology with the aim of extinguishing or eliminating that group, all right? And, and the thing is, is that because of racial trauma, because of the intersectionality of it, this is just an example, that's still believed by many. <clears throat> and, and what it's talking about is that he says, menticide is a part of enslavement, where your life-sustaining resources of one group are controlled by another group, okay? Then, then, then you get this whole thing about the inability to tell the truth. You, 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 you capture truth in these ways of protecting. So I'm not going to tell you the truth about your father. You know, he's a, he's a knucklehead, but I'm not going to tell you the truth of that because I want you to be okay. And so you realize that one of the truths is, is that many times America does not see the need for people of color. 
okay, for for Alanis. It's just this is, you know, and 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 and, and, and that's not true. Um, may not be true, but if folk believe it. Okay, that's, that's the piece. Please, if you heard my sermon, that's the dialectic. Okay, that's the, that's the dialectic. It didn't have to be true to be believed. Okay, it didn't have to be this thing that everybody accepts for it be a thing that affects the, marginal, the, the marginalizing community. And that's what's there. And, and, and so is that until they recognize the truth is, uh, and are able to challenge these kind of thoughts, you get this double bind. I, you, you, you know, I, I depend upon you, I need you on the one hand, but you don't want me on the other. You know, I, I, I recognize that we could be one, but on the other hand, I don't really know how to trust you. And so you get this, eh, and that's a part of the trauma, all right? And if you don't believe this happened, it's probably because a lot of what happened around the world that really caused these kind of divisions, I think there's been some kind of enslavement maybe in this country or, Maybe, maybe somebody died after trying to do civil rights. You know, maybe, maybe somebody got lynched. I don't know, it could be, I could be making it up. I could be in another world, another atmosphere, uh, another universe, um, but anyway. And what it, what it results in, one of the things that result, and, and this is the fun thing to work with in therapy. I'm sorry, y'all, but I'm a therapist. <laughs> you know, uh, it's fun to work in, you know, unconditional submission. People wonder why you get rule breakers. It's because you recognize I've got to somehow go against this because it's not really working for my well-being. Now, now I'm just going to be very clear with you all. I was a superstar faculty member until I took a church. I took the church because when my grant ended, I had a million and a half dollar grant, and I was about to get another grant, I'm away at a conference. And when I come back, the university has kicked all my folk out because the grant wasn't renewed. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm bringing you in, and then I'm bringing, I'm bringing them in about $10 million a year, and they're telling me you can no longer get any of that money because you know you're a faculty member, you get your money and 33% above it. It's that after that, you need to hire some folk because you can't do all the work yourself. I'm like, well, how can I not do the work and you can accept the money for the work? So I got a church. I figured I had a degree in theology. I could preach a little bit. Oh, y'all missed it, okay, y'all, yeah. Y'all missed it, y'all missed it, y'all missed it, y'all missed it, y'all missed it. You have to get to a point as you're working with folk from marginalized communities, whatever those are, however you define it, is helping them to recognize you don't have to unconditionally surrender to this power. Okay, you can't, I wouldn't be where I am now if I had not said, I'm gonna do my own thing because either I'd be crazy or I'd be broke. Ah, okay. A sense of personal inferiority. A lot of times where we're located is designed to cause us to be inferior. And you've got to find those spaces and places where you can feel like you got it all together. You know, I, I love it when I talk to folks. It's like, okay, I do my work, but I go to the church and I get blessed there singing in the choir, playing in the band doing my poetry, those kind of things bring me wholeness. Ah, okay, and see, the, the difference is, in some communities, that's just what you're taught to do. When you're in a community where there's trauma and there's abuse and there's confusion and there's gender because you're a woman, you're not supposed to be a part of this, it's not so awesomely taught. And we've got to accept that. You know, I'm preaching to the choir, I hope. And of course, anybody seen the movie um, Django? Do you see J Samuel Jackson's character? That's still a representation of the master's welfare synonymous with your own. And we've got to recognize, one, who the master is. That's a whole other story. You know, that's, that's the easy part. If we fix it right there. Who's the master? It ain't, it ain't you whether you own this place or not. It's somebody greater. OK, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> a willingness to accept 
the slaveholder standard of God. And we've moved now in, 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 in formally enslaved, you know, to get away from the language. Um, sometimes I like to visit the language because it's good to think about how it was when it was said. All right, this is how it was said back then. And so, and the last piece is the habit of dependency. And one of the things that I, as you all develop your clinical peace with people of color is to recognize that one of the things you want to really focus on is how do you deal with this, this issue of dependency? You know, that that's just not there. You've got to be able to stand alone. You've got to be able to accept the darts, you know, but that's not, you know, when, you, when you're nurtured in your community, you know, like I was, speak the king's English. Walk a certain way. Don't cause trouble. Don't stir up anything. You know, you, 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 you're learning really to just be dependent rather than to be the maverick. Okay. All right. And that, that moves you to kind of what I, I talk a lot about and something to think about. You've got the one circle of, of social race. You've got another circle of class. You've got another circle of gender. And you can, you, many times you need to look at just the gender and class. If you look at me, for example, class, I, 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 right now, I'm upper class. Thank God, hallelujah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but, but the complexities, even within me, my grandmother, her family, her father was a major um, shaker and mover in a community where he had, uh, this is my great-grandfather on my, my grandmother's side, paternal grandmother's side, and in Detroit, he, he's one of the ones who, one of the few ones who had the really nice car and would ride down and just throw $1 bills. You know, people loved him. My grand uncle was allowed to be in that business. My grandmother was not. And she was made to go to school, made to get an education, and became the first registered nurse in Detroit, Michigan, of color, okay? One of the first. And so she was middle class and, and doing very well. And I used to love to go to her house because she had stuff, you know. My father, because of his military work and then the, 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 the pain that happened in the military, he wound up never going to college and wound up working as a mechanic. And so we were working class. When my father left, my mother, who was more brilliant than my dad, of course, like most women are more brilliant than most men, but that's, y'all don't like that, so I'm not gonna say it. Um, but my mom um, only had a valedictorian of her high school, but never went to college because somebody was born. You know, hallelujah. <laughs> and, and, and when dad left us, um, I'm the oldest of seven, in 1968, we went from working class to age-dependent children. We went to poverty. And so you, there's a part of me that still remembers government cheese, still remembers the struggle of not being able to pay the bills, lights being out, et cetera, in the home. That's a part of me. And then there's the me that went to college, and I go to this college, and it's just weird, okay. Um, and now I'm, you know, so the class, even for me, has so many pieces. Gender has so many pieces, so that's kind of there. And then the, the, the key intersection, oops, the key intersection, of course, is in the middle there, where you got race, class, and gender going on. You got three pieces, so you got that, all that complexity is around one part of me. You, complex, you, you complicate that by all three of those pieces, and then magnify what all three of those pieces have those same typical variables to them. You've got that intersection. So it's not, we use intersectionality, and they talk about it in a way where it's this boo, bad word, this boogie word that's out there right now, but it's because folk don't really understand what it means. It means to look at these pieces of a person and understand them that way. And that's one of the fun parts of, of being a therapist is, is actually getting into that and go, going through that as well. Anybody need me to slow down or say something different, let me know. Um, so complex trauma for me is then the, the exposure to sequential stress experiences such as racism, casteism, sexism, um, classism. And, and I love um, Isabel Wilkerson's book on caste. I would recommend that highly to anyone who wants to look further at this can manifest in a client as complex trauma, particularly when there's emotional abnormalities, loss of safety, direction, the inability to detect and define danger cues, et cetera, all that's going on. Uh, so the internal power is how these things are internalized and the power has to come from rejecting that internalization. Uh, you, 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 you internalize all these isms 
And that's, that's one of the places where the internalized oppression happens. You fight both within yourself against that which happens in, in a way which is not healthy to yourself. And three uh, or four of the ways of getting around that for me are just the prayer warriors, uh, again, going back to where we are, the revolutionary healers, the subversive stewards, and the internal and external resistors, accomplices, and allies. And I can say more about those, but let me just take, for example, I, I would consider myself both, a, I'm not a prayer warrior. Um, that's, that's my wife, praise the Lord, hallelujah, for partnership. You know? So she's praying for me even now because she knows the dude ain't prayed enough. Um, <laughs> but, but I am a revolutionary healer. And, and what that is, is a healer who uses the wounds to transform communities, okay? It's, it's a person who has been healed, because you don't want a, a healer who's not been healed, okay? Because they can do more damage. But a healed person who can then use that to transform community with the work that they do. That's also what I would, I consider myself a subversive steward. Um, and and in, in particular, I remember I was telling the, uh, someone earlier today, in 1968, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, I happened to be, of course, I just lost my dad. And, and back up a little bit, my dad preached when I was seven. Uh, he was my pastor. And I literally received salvation from that sermon. I went home that night and just had a vision that a hand came out of the room, out of the ceiling, and just touched me. And I have never been the same since then. That, that changed me. My father then baptized me. My father then became the abuser I talked about a, mo a little while ago. So that's all going on. Then, but in, in April the 4th, 16th of 1968, my, daughter, my sister and I are listening to the radio. I'm babysitting my youngest sister. And they announced that Martin Luther King has been assassinated. That's her birthday. So that day has stuck with me. And I said to my little sister, I'm going to one day grow up to be Reverend Dr. M.L. McCrary and continue his work. Now, I've done that, but I've done that in a way that didn't get me assassinated. Okay? That's why I use subversive steward. I did it in a way where I literally knew what it took to be both a good researcher and a good clinician and a good pastor. And one of the things I talk about in the book is that I was able to take a class because people valued my class on health and human services for upper level undergrads. And, they, and we became a community engagement class. So that class came to the church and they were the, they were the ones who would mentor and advise a group of third graders brown and black boys who were considered to be failing in their rooms, in their grades, they came to the church for after school programs and this group would then counsel them. Then the members of the church that we were pastoring, of course, became the elders and the wise stewards, the, the shamans who came in and gave them advice and all. And we did, and I did martial arts training, we did my impact program, which is a problem solving program, and those boys' lives were changed, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm honored to talk about the fact that, yes, I'm the first African-American that was hired by Virginia Commonwealth University the Department of Psychology. I'm the first African-American, a person of color, to get tenured in that department. I'm the first to get a $1.5 million grant in that department. But when I left there, there were nine other people of color in positions. I had graduated 19 PhDs, women and men of color, to do the work, and some white boys too, because I like y'all, you know, and, you know. And, and, you know, and so that, that's the kind of way that I saw to make that difference, all right, as well. Um, and so then, then, and then, but you need partners. And, and I tell this all the time, one of my best partners was a, a female um, therapist. We did supervision together. And she grew me because we, we would talk about it in, in our conversations. So she would say, look, Micah, you just do crazy because that's what you were trained to do. And there's, there's, some, there's some good, there's some, uh, uh, anybody knows my boy Whitaker, he supervised me, go make crazy, that was his thing, and I can, I can upset a room, y'all. And she would say, but yeah, but I will shepherd the room after you upset them. 
you know. And together, you know, we would rock folk, and then she would help them to gather the rocking and throw the rocks back at me, which, you know, I'm, I'm handle, I can handle. That's where you need internal, external resistors, accomplices, and allies as well. All right, some underlying theories. For me, one of the basic ones, two scriptures that underlie what I do. And of course, this one here, I, I understand liberation theology, I understand process theology, I understand reform theology. This scripture, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, to recover sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bruised. But this day, this is this day, this is revealed in your life. That's one. The other piece, I didn't put it in here, is um, I, I'm going to come back to this text. I'm going to come back to this. But I want to do this other scripture. Yeah. The other piece for me is the Luke 13, the barren fig tree, where, and, 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 and this, is, this is the perverse of Stuart again in me. The man had a fig tree planted in the vineyard. He came looking for fruit and found none. So he says, point blank to the gardener, cut it down. Okay, cut it down. I've been coming here for three years and I don't find anything here. Why should it waste the soil? The gardener replies, sir, let it alone for one more year. Don't cut it down yet. Let me get my hands dirty. Let me get my hands with the manure. Let me prune it. Let me prepare it. And then if it doesn't bear fruit, cut it down. Those two pieces for me undergird where I am. The first piece, and this is just basic psychology, I want to give it, our prefrontal cortex regulates empathy, insight, reciprocal flexibility, body regulation, moral decision making. That's the cortex, that's, that's the part that covers the, 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 the brain, okay, that, that cortex there. The frontal lobe is there when it is thick. If that prefrontal cortex is thin, okay, if it's thin, it yields these powers to the limbic system. It yields them to the limbic system. Once the limbic system takes over, instead of the prefrontal cortex doing all these great things on that side of the screen, when the limbic system takes over, we then fall into fight, flight, or freeze. Okay, that's just not natural. That's, that's, that's the defensive posture. That's what the body does to defend itself. I'm in trouble, let me run. I'm in trouble, let me fight. I'm in trouble, let me freeze. It also moves us to asking, am I safe? And when people begin to ask those questions in your system, recognize they are operating out of the limbic system. That means that their prefrontal cortex has been taken over, it's been thinned. When you find folk who just are, are, are judgmental, they just, uh, they're being oppressive in the way they're doing things, it's saying to you, this person has been thinned. So how do you thicken it? Let me show you this, okay? What happens is when we build up our healthy attachments, when we build up self-respect, when we build up feelings that are safe and safe places and safe spaces and positive emotions and self-love, the trauma is not so powerful because it doesn't have room to be powerful. It thickens the prefrontal cortex. Research has shown it thickens the prefrontal cortex. It thickens it. So when we pray, when we worship, when we have relationships, when we disciple, when we do all that we do in church, what we're doing is thickening prefrontal cortexes. I also like this one, y'all. It's old school. It's Wembley probably. It's old pastoral care and counseling. But it just works for me, okay? Our churches are very, very good at helping people cope and helping them sustain. What I argue that we don't need to really focus on in church are the reconciliations and the healing because that's harder work. There's so much stuff that goes on to get the healing and reconciliation. That's where I say is the, is the place of a professional. I teach pastors all the time, what you want to do, pastoral care and counseling for good sessions and then refer. 
but you should refer to folk that you've already interviewed, you've already vetted. And if you could actually get to a more of an EAP program to where you paid me to hold 10 spaces for you. You got 30 members, you know, you, you're gonna need three, I'm gonna need counseling. You got 300 members, 30 gonna need counseling. You got 3,000 members, 300 gonna need counseling. Okay, let the therapist know. You know, and it happened to me when I first started working, great pastor Darrell Rollins called me out to lunch, took me out to the Jeffersonian in Richmond, Virginia. I ain't never had money to go to the Jeffersonian. I'm walking in the Jeffersonian, you know, yeah, you know. He's like, sit down, have a seat. I want to interview you and make sure that you are theologically in the same space as I'm in, that you're not going to hurt my folk if I refer them to you. You know, and that was, that was a gift to me. And I, I started teaching that to everybody. You don't need to do this, you know? And that makes a difference because there are a lot of therapists who I would not refer my worst enemy to. You know, I was telling the other person the other day, they called me in and they told me what the therapist did. And I'm like, and I supervised that person. Oh my gosh. I had to call the therapist. You can't do that. You know, but that's, that's, that's but people make mistakes. And, 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 and therapists are people. Y'all don't believe it, but it, really, we are people. And every pastor, by the way, should have a therapist. Every pastor should have a spiritual director. Every pastor should have a crew of folk that you trust, you know, that are your people. So if you don't have those, and then by pastor, I mean ministry, chaplains, uh, youth persons, people who just hang out at the church to clean it up, whatever you do. All right, all right, all right. All right. Now, I use in my book, um, Kasugi, because to me, that's what I see the Holy Spirit being, okay? When, when I first started work, um, I had this one student who was an a, a artist who worked in making pottery, and he made me this beautiful bowl I had in my office, and this one adolescent lost it one day, and he just broke it. I still don't know whether it was on purpose or by accident. And we took all the pieces from the broken bowl and put it back into the bowl. And it, you could kind of see that these were the edges of the broken bowl. And I had it in my office for like 20 plus years. And later on when I was working, I ran into Kasugi, okay, Kasugi, which is where you take the broken pottery and you mend it with gold or silver or brass. And it's then of more value than it was even before it was broken. And that's really what I see happening in counseling spaces is that we take broken pieces and we allow the Holy Spirit to mend them. And when that happens, that's, that's another theory I use. My favorite theory that I use still is, it was done by American Psychological Association, it's about self-disclosure. But I see this as about counseling. That literally there are four parts of us. There's a part that's open to the community. And that's where it's known to you and you let other folks know. There are also these places in us that are just healthy. They're known to you, and you don't need anybody else to know them. Okay, and those are your private, secret stuff. And I tell you all the time, look, keep that stuff to yourself. Even if you got a really, really good therapist that you can sue her pants off if she tells it, then you go ahead and you disclose it there. But make sure you can sue her, okay? Make sure you write it down. I told her this, and when she tells it, you take her to court, get the license, take it away, okay? There, there needs, I mean, there's just some things, I don't know, but maybe nobody in here has made mistakes like I have. I've done some things I don't want anybody to know. I ain't telling anybody. I'm going to my grave with my repentant. I've taken it to the Lord in the confession booth and say, Lord, here it is. It's yours. I'm so sorry I did it. I'll never do it again. You know, nobody else, nobody raise your hand. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> all y'all, oh, hallelujah. Oh, God, holy folk. Okay. Uh, for those, those who are not as holy as, as you all are, like, more like myself, um, they're hidden. For you don't need hidden, just, just scratch an X through that box, okay? It's kind of cool. Then, then the, I think this is where I, I call it the pastoral area, the area where it's not known to you and is known to others, and particularly people who care about you. That, that pastoral for me can be best friends. It, you know, I, I love my, my partner and I, we've been friends for seven years and now we've been married for 41 years. That person is able to tell me stuff that I, I mean, I was, I was interviewing at New Brunswick and you know, this is, this is 2017. I did my training to be a president in 2007, you know, and I decided I didn't really like being a president. That's what I told myself. And so I'm interviewing for the presidency of New Brunswick Theological Seminary. 
And in the middle of the interview, this one wonderful student who I just adore um, said to me, uh, Dr. McCrary, you know, in order to become president of New Brunswick, you need to become reformed. And I said, yeah. He's like, no, you need to switch over from being Baptist to being reformed. I said, okay, yeah. I see you taking this too lightly. It's like you're taking off your Baptist jacket and you're putting back on a reform jacket. And I, you know, it trigger y'all, trigger. Cause I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to close down my practice, which is making more money y'all giving me. I've got to leave my church, my wife and I both, which is more money than y'all giving me. And I don't know what else, but I just don't like what you just said. You know, and, and, and literally, Reverend General Secretary, I said to them, you know, this has been a great conversation. God bless you, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm out, you know. And I went back, I got home, and my wife and my daughter both said, you know, how'd it go? They looked at me like, we, we want you to know, we were praying that you would not sabotage, because every time you get close to becoming a president, you figure out a way to blow it. I'm like, wow. <laughs> and I pray, I'm like, God, if this is really what you want, show me, you know. And, 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 the, and the board, you know, made a deal. They, they called, you know, and we talked again, and, and, and I'm there. Um, you know, but we, there, there's, there's just, and that was a blind spot. You know, I was worried about the fact that once you're in this kind of position, I can't be the subversive steward anymore. Okay, I can't, I can't utilize the tools that I've used. I've got to now, I'm public. You know, I never looked at Facebook. I never did a post on Facebook, but now I gotta post because it's gotta put New Brunswick out there, you know. I, I, ooh, just, ooh, you know, and because of that, you know, they, they saw that. And then this is my favorite, where I live and where I pray a lot of you all will continue to live is this space of the unknown. The unknown is where it's not known to you and it's not known to others. I call that spiritual care because God has tapped a few of us that who have gone through the valley of the shadow of death and we know you can make it through. And so even though I don't know what's gonna happen, I'm willing to go through that with you because we're in this spiritual place. The spirit can work with this no matter what we think, feel, or do know. And that's, that to me is that, that last space of the unknown. Ah, when the advocate comes, when the advocate comes, when the spirit of truth comes. Mm. So my Lord, can y'all pray this with me? My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not know the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean Any questions so far before I move to the last part of this? Yes. If the therapist is healed, uh, amen. So the question is, what questions would I have you to ask to know that the therapist is healed? I think in the interview to just ask that question uh, is the first question, you know, to just ask before I, before I surrender myself, how healthy are you? Um, and to really look at, you know, where are you with family? Where are you theologically? Where are you practically? What, you know, how many folk would recommend you to me? Um, those are things that I would do as well. One of the pieces I think that gets, gets even deeper underneath that is I know you're not going to disclose to me in therapy. And, and, and I think that's wise because, and if I don't forget my other thought, that's wise because self-referencing is the tool I would recommend, is that you reference your emotions, but you don't self-disclose. Because when I self-disclose, it puts the focus on me and takes it off of the patient. 
And so I wouldn't do that as well. So I know you can't disclose once we start work together. What are some things you can disclose to me that demonstrate you're all right? So I would, I would do it that way. Um, yes, sir. Pass the mic. Boom. Mic check, mic check, mic check. Um, all right, so I guess while we're on um, the topic of like, you know, a healed person, and you know, twice I've heard you say today that a, um, uh, an unhealed person can't heal people, you know. Um, so while I've been here at Western Seminary, I've had the privilege of being discipled by um, Dr. Carlos Thompson. He's a practical theologian and disability theologian. Okay. And one thing that I've gleaned from sitting at his feet is that there's an extent to which, um, for one reason or another, the way we conceive of uh, illness or disease or health or unhealth um, can be uh, not always conducive to what you know Scripture says yeah. is true about those who have received the, he the promise of the healing of Jesus. Yeah. Um, and it's not so obvious to me that anybody can be fully healed this side of the eschaton. So, you know, it seems a little bit weird to me that we... It doesn't actually seem at all right to me to qualify of any other person that they're not healed. It's like, you know, well, what makes me so sure of that? Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. As yeah. somebody who I would say categorically this side of the eschaton yeah. is not going to be fully healed. Yeah. So I think healing is a process. And so you, you may be different places, spaces along the continuum of healing. So it, it's continuous. It's not, boom, you're healed. It's continuous. Peter is my best example that I can get right now for that. That prior to the crucifixion, you know, Peter was a loud mouth, like yours truly, you know, was just extroverted out there trying to do everything else he could. And he, it, I think it took that denying of Jesus' experience that brokenness that he had to experience that moved him to a different space. But then it took that encounter on the bank with the fish where he said, Peter, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And he confronted him and he dined with him. It took the reception of the Holy Spirit and you know, that, that moved him to where then in Acts he could stand up and say, this what you see is not drunkenness. And so I think, I, I, so, and I think he still continued to grow even after that. But you can, you, you can most folk who've been healed you can pinpoint, like I can pinpoint in 1993 when I read the letter my father wrote me in 86 saying he wanted to become a healer when I was still a graduate student in psychology, I mean in theology rather, and then I'm now accepting the position as a healer. You know, that, that healed me. I, I look to that today and can say that's the moment that I really overcame a number of my trauma experiences and I can sit with you now. But I'm still continuing to heal. You know, every day, every day is a day of healing. And so I, I would put that caveat there and, and welcome that interpretation. Others, this is good. If you wanna write down a question too, if you want one of us to ask it um, anonymously too, you can do that as well, just naming that. Just name it, yes. So when you were talking about the- Hold on, because we're streaming, I think. When you were talking about the prefrontal cortex. Yes thinning and thickening. Yes. Um, first, I just want to clarify, that's literal, right? You're talking about like a literal yes. part of your brain getting thinner. Um, and then secondly... It may be that the neurological functioning works better though. Yeah. Yeah, so, but, but it's still the work of there. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And so then my follow-up question to that is, what does that process look like? How much time does it take for those neurological connections yeah. to change? I, for any behavior to change, it takes nine, months, nine, nine weeks, I think it is, you know, but those kind of things. And so for me, for that kind of, of physiological change to happen, it's going to take that amount of time. And then it takes the practice of doing it. And so I tell people all the time that it takes 10 years to really become a good therapist. And I would tell anyone, I would say it takes about 10 years to really master these things. And so, yeah, so I, I put a longer time on it than I'm sure others do. Um, so I have a question about, so it's pretty intuitive, the, pl the role that all of this plays in therapy, in even some forms of pastoral work. 
I'm curious about what you would say its role is in institutions mm -hmm. and in schooling. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's a lot of ways to thrive. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that people thrive in a school is the catalog, mm -hmm. right? The, the rule book, mm -hmm. the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I think for many, when the environment is a stranger to you, you function out of the trauma, right? Mm -hmm. But all, but the response to that is a, is a checklist, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you, you didn't pass that, you didn't pass that, you didn't pass that. But I wonder, especially at a spiritual institution, right, an, an institution of faith, if there is any responsibility to the trauma, especially as we say that we do care mm -hmm. about diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm curious about, you know, if those things were in place, rule books and all of that kinds of thing, mm -hmm. I, you know, the hearts of people change, but if those things were in place at a time where maybe some people weren't wanted, what part should this play mm -hmm. in informing the change? Okay. Okay. And, and so I think that institutions like individuals have a continuum as well, that no institution should ever feel that it's reached that point. Um, it, it's, it's perfected. You know, one of the things why a number of our seminaries are dying is because we stopped transforming. And you know, so until we recognize that we've got to change and transform, we're gonna to continue to die. Where we focus on the transforming varies, and, and I think it always will, and so, I think strategically you have to look at where do I want to transform? Um, what, what battles do I want to fight? Because every battle has a cost. There's, there's gonna be some wins and some losses with whatever battle you choose to fight. So if we fight the battle of gender, we fight the battle of including women, you know, there's some people who still believe that a woman should not speak publicly in a church, should still be under, I mean, those things are gonna always come up. We make that choice and then we develop strategically how we're going to support how we're going to undergird, how we're going to lift up, how we're going to educate, evaluate, excess, and then redo it and do it again. And that for institutional wise, that's the way I would say that it's done. I think two, there has to be the building of alliances where we're actually together with others to do this work. What the lone wolf, the lone ranger dies quickly and doesn't often continue to live. And so much more that a tribe does it that an individual does it, and that it be done in tribe, in collective groups, is a proper way to do it. And so that would be there as well. But an institution has to make the determination, the decision that this is a battle I want to fight. And that, you know, and, but there, 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 there are major consequences. Um, New Brunswick chose to fight it back in 2005, and I think it's cost New Brunswick tremendously from becoming such a diverse institution. You know, and, and, and then you got a different battle to deal with that as well on yes. that same regard. How do Alana students in a predominantly white institution challenge unconditional submission when grade and ordination are at stake? They are, have to be willing to fail. You know, and, 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 and that is painful. I mean, it's painful. It's painful to, when you're, you're prone to be a person to succeed, you, you, you're used to doing well and to recognize I may be penalized for taking this position is, is a difficult thing to do, but that's a decision that has to be made that I will die on this point. You know, this is the heel I choose to die on. And that's, that's a hard thing. It's not fair for the student that the institution has put that kind of pressure there. I, I agree with that. But for those of us who have fought those battles that, you know, I, I, I love to still go back and watch so much about Martin, about Lincoln in particular, those two, and look at the battles they fought and the costs. And they realize, if I do this, I will most likely be killed. And that's, that's the hard part of revolutionary work. But that's, that's what revolutionary healers have to choose to do. You know. I have one follow-up question. Um, because we have a lot of people here in different positions, what is the... I mean, you gave us a lot of wisdom, but even like in following up in that question, what is something maybe from an educational place that could be a takeaway or a question to consider when building um, 
course loads to consider different diverse bodies of people within yeah. their work? Yeah. Well, for Virginia Commonwealth University, I assumed the position of teaching the multicultural class when I became there. And, and I continued to educate and be educated to teach it. Um, that was a part, and it became a part of the curriculum where every graduate student would take that course. At New Brunswick, we have a similar rule. We, I moved it from anti-racism to power and privilege because I wanted it to include the intersectionality and not just one component. But every student, every staff member, every board member, every faculty member takes the workshop. I didn't like the way the workshop was being taught by an outside agency um, because it was just too punitive, particularly to white males. I, I, didn't, I didn't value that. And so we redid the workshop to where now four faculty members teach it. Um, and, and it's, you know, we, we're, we're different. And so there's, you know, Beth Tanner, white female, Janet McLean Farrell, a black Jamaican female, um, Jeremy, Nathan Jeremy Brink, who's white male, you know, myself. We teach it. And it's much more, because my thing is, if you injure folk in the workshop, they're not going to continue. Okay, it's done. And so inclusive there, and then we have the, the classes that people take if they choose to go further. And the, the, but yeah, wrap it up. We have about five minutes, and I have people have given me some questions, but I want to. Does anybody else? Okay, so we have a question from someone in the audience, and one of the ones I read, by the way, was written by someone else too. How can one overcome the feeling of worthlessness caused by institutional stress or trauma related to race, culture, and class? I think by internalizing the injury. I think we run away from the injury, um, and so. Even with my anger example, you know, that's, that's a part of me now. And, and I have disciplined my emotional self, not in a negative way, but in a healthy way to where I can share, I can talk, and I'm very comfortable facing that anger in somebody else. And I think the more we do that, rather than externalizing it and sending it away and hiding it in the closet, where it will only resurrect itself at some later date, um, we deal with it. I think that's where the therapy that's where the, the spiritual director, because I believe that the two go well together. I'm glad I do both, but the two go well together, are critical to people healing from that. Does anybody else have any final questions? OK, can we give it up for <laughs> Dr. Michael McCreary? Dr. McCreary, I would love it if we would close out praying for you as you continue to go on and do this work, and um, not only at New Brunswick, but as you're speaking to others and educating us and helping transform thought. If that's okay. Can I put a hand on you? <laughs> so, yeah, join me. Lay your hand on me, Jesus. Yes. I don't want to <laughs> Father God, I thank you so much for just being in a space, Lord, where we can just continue to be transformed and be in a place, Lord, where we're hearing stories, where we're learning from one another, and intentionally today, Lord, learning from Dr. McCreary, God. I thank you for the story in which you have been writing in his life since when he was a kid to now. I thank you, Lord, for the authority in which he has walked in and the way that your Holy Spirit has been walking alongside being a helper. I pray, Lord, as he continues to speak, as he continues to travel, as he continues to build up the next generation and continue, Lord, to transform leaders and institutions and churches and different places, God, that you would just continue to use him as your mouthpiece, that you would continue, Lord, to just bring in new ideas, that you would give supernatural solution to worldly problems, God. Mm -hmm. And so we just thank you, Lord, that in the midst of the fractures of the world, God, that you are using other people to be your hands and feet, Lord, and you are moving. So we thank you for Dr. McCreary, God. Bless him in his travels. Continue to be with him and his family, his daughter, his wife, and um, every place that he has authority over. So, Lord, we just thank you, and we just also pray, Lord, that whatever is here for Western Theological Seminary, God, that it would just grow, that you would water it. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being a part. Tomorrow we have a lunch. If you want to be a part of our community conversation, you can ask more questions. We're also going to have 
more conversation, and we just want to invite you to be a part of that. So that's it. Go in peace. <laughs>